Hello, and welcome to Acute Neck Injury. Here we're gonna explore common causes of acute neck injury um, and help differentiate which ones uh, may be more dangerous than others. We'll be talking about whiplash and its long-term prognosis. And then we'll be talking about therapies that uh, make a difference and those where uh, they're routinely used but not recommended uh, for acute neck injury. And I think those in particular will be important for answering questions on USMLE. All right, so let's start with a case just to bring us up to speed. I'm seeing a previously healthy 48-year-old man. He was in a motor vehicle accident yesterday. He was taken to the emergency department as a precaution because he did have some neck pain, but his x-rays were negative for fracture. He still has eight out of 10 pain though and reduced range of motion in his neck today. It's not that unusual a case where patients get in an acute trauma, they end up going to the emergency department. So, and that's key here because the patient who goes to the emergency department, particularly if I've got some kind of record uh, that indeed their x-ray was done and it was negative, um, that's gonna be very, very important for me. The patient who comes in fresh, you know, within 24 hours after a major trauma, such as a car accident, um, I'm going to be a lot more aggressive in recommending films for that patient because there is always the chance there could be a fracture that we're missing in somebody with eight out of 10 pain and limited range of motion. Uh, but that's been taken care of in this case. So I think this is a case a little bit more typical to what we might see in primary care. And, and I just wanted to point out the key is that, that they did go to the ED immediately afterwards. So let's take a, take a look at the epidemiology of acute neck pain. It's really common. Uh, about one in 10 uh, adults will develop neck pain at some point in their lifetime. It's actually similar in terms of its prevalence to low back pain, but it doesn't get the attention of low back pain, uh, particularly because it tends to be less chronic and there's less disability associated with neck pain. Still, there's more than 1 million cases of whiplash in the US annually. Um, that said, it's not usually whiplash, which is related to an acute trauma, the most common cause of ne neck pain is more uh, repetitive injury. And that's happening more and more frequently. It's not just in jobs that are highly physical in nature, although I certainly see it in those jobs. It's a lot of folks who spend a lot of uh, time at keyboards every day and aren't necessarily thinking about the ergonomics of their workstations uh, can develop neck pain as well. So for whiplash specifically, it requires an, a history of acute injury. So it has to be a car accident, uh, something that happened, maybe a slip and fall or uh, a few other types of acute injury where that's where the pain started. Um, the symptoms are, are pretty common to, to cause them neck pain, you know, pain, reduced mobility, and occipital headache. It's actually not really well understood why, um, why whiplash occurs and why it can be so severe in terms of the stiffness. But the muscles definitely, there is an inflammatory component and the muscles react. There is some minor swelling around them uh, and that becomes so painful the patient has a hard time uh, moving her or his neck. Um, and imaging is, fre is frequently gonna be negative for these patients. You might see oftentimes some chronic uh, degenerative changes but uh, nothing acute, thankfully. So let's talk about cervical radiculopathy, and this is where there's a nerve involvement uh, emanating from uh, the spinal cord uh, that's complicating neck pain. So again, this of course may be caused by an acute trauma. Um, therefore, it's really important to consider a complete neurological exam for all patients with neck pain. That includes motor, sensory, and deep tendon reflexes in the upper and lower extremities. Sperling's test can be helpful, and that's where patients say if they're having right-sided symptoms, flexion of the neck to that side with a pressure over, the clinician stands over the patient and puts a downward pressure directly on the head and that may reproduce symptoms. And just remember that the radiculopathy, it may be caused by a trauma, um, but it may also be due to uh, chronic disc damage as well. Uh, that bulging disc, uh, usually between the levels of C6 and T1 uh, can explain uh, why patients are having radiculopathy and the distribution of their symptoms uh, in terms of pain will tell you which nerve root is affected. Now, that said, even for cervical radiculopathy, whiplash, the management of these uh, different causes of neck pain really should follow about the same order because it's usually going to be uh, a time-limited type of symptom. Uh, just the more time will, will improve things. I like acetaminophen as a first-line analgesic. Um, why? Because it tends to be a little bit safer than others. And, uh, and usually better tolerated overall. 
Um, but it may not be enough and may not be as effective. Uh, therefore, uh, think about NSAIDs, second line. Not a great difference in terms of superiority of NSAIDs versus acetaminophen for a musculoskeletal pain. Uh, but they might be more effective. They do, you know, you have to watch. They can promote gastrointestinal bleeding. Uh, you have to be careful in patients with heart disease or renal disease and taking NSAIDs too. Muscle relaxants. I really don't feel like there's much of a place for muscle relaxants. They don't have a specific therapeutic target. They do tend to make people very tired. Um, there is some risk of abuse associated with these agents as well. So don't really seem to have as much of a role. Tramadol is, kind of, is, is a uh, mu opioid uh, receptor uh, agonist. And so therefore uh, does activate uh, the natural opioid sy system. It's, uh, it's not, it doesn't have the addictive potential as other opiates, but it still has some addictive potential and can be used, particularly when used with acetaminophen, uh, can be uh, more effective than either alone. And then opiates are really a last line. Uh, generally, the, our, our Center for Disease Control in the U.S. recommends they shouldn't be used for more than seven days, most cases three days at most. So a short course of opiates for somebody who's really suffering, uh, but not prolonging therapy down the road, I think is important. Other treatments that you may see recommended for neck pain. Um, cervical collars are not helpful, so immobilization does not help, and therefore that may come up on your exam. Do not recommend it. Home exercises in of themselves, they're really, un it's unclear whether they're effective or not. Physical therapy, on the other hand, can be effective for these patients. I'll usually reserve it for patients who are in a prolonged course of pain, you know, more than several weeks where it just seems to be not getting better, yet I've got negative imaging studies. Um, physical therapy can be a good option for those patients. They may also think about spinal manipulation. Overall, there really isn't enough data to recommend nor refute the use of spinal manipulations for cases of neck pain. So just a little bit more about whiplash. About half of whiplash patients continue to have neck pain at one year. So if you're that severe that you have this, that severe stiffness, the severe muscle tension with headache uh, that indicates whiplash after an acute injury, unfortunately half will go on to continue to have symptoms. But there is a link between financial compensation or time off work and the duration of neck pain in these cases. And with that, so with that, you know, what we did today was really kind of differentiate a little bit of whiplash versus cervical radiculopathy. We went through a very typical algorithm for the management of uh, musculoskeletal pain that I'll probably return to a couple times uh, when we talk about other issues such as uh, back pain, for example, or arthritis. Uh, but I think that is very important to keep in mind as you move forward is starting with your um, more safe drugs with a proven record and then really holding opiates out for the patients who, who need them and then trying to keep that course as uh, short as possible. So hopefully that was very helpful for you today. Look forward to seeing you next time.